Amen. Turn with me now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 17. We're hoping you brought your Bibles, but we'll also try to put those verses on the board for you. Hallelujah. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, and at this time, many were questioning, as it is today, did this person who they know really lived, was a real person, split time in half, most quoted in everything he did, but where the rubber meets the road is, did he rise? And so Paul addresses this in writing to the Corinthian church, and he's addressing it by the Holy Spirit to us today. And he says, And if Christ has not been raised, verse 17, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. And if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied above all men. Wow. Folks, he's saying there, and this might challenge some of you here, uh, maybe you're visiting, maybe you're a guest, maybe you're kind of doing the Easter thing because, you know, your wife made you come, or, you know, maybe you're just, you know, coming because you hadn't been in a while and want to check it out, but you've never really contemplated this whole truth. Is this guy Jesus really the Lord and Savior of the world? Is he the Son of God? Did he rise from the grave? Well, like I said, you know, if you ever looked into history, you, you'll have to understand that he was a real person. But now we have to address this issue. The Bible says if he didn't rise from the grave, we might as well burn the church, close the doors, head out of here. We might as well go home. If he didn't rise, you're still in your sins. That's what it says. And your faith is futile. And we, the Christians, you know, if, we, if he didn't rise, we should be pitied above all men. If, if only in this life, if he just taught about loving your enemy and being kind to your wife and how to raise your family and uh, being good and turning the other cheek, if he just taught you that only for these 50, 60, 80 years that you live, we should be pitied. I'm telling you, praise God, he's telling us there's much more than it. It's not only he died and rose to give us victory to operate in this life, but praise God, now and forever. Amen. You see, this life is short, 60, 70, 80 years. Who knows? Sometimes in America we can live to 95. I don't know. But praise God, we have something much more. If it's only this life, we're to be pitied. But he's saying, praise God, I've got something much better for you. I am the resurrection in the life. He who believes in me shall never die. We shall continue to live forever. There's going to be people, a new heaven and a new earth. Hey, we are celebrating the greatest event in history now, but there's another one coming, his return. So we're living in between the greatest event, the first one, and the second one. This same Jesus who rose from the grave is coming back, and when he does, his reward is with him, amen? There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and all those who chose to believe in him and have received him are going to live with him forever, amen? amen? So we're living in between the two greatest events and really, as we study Bible prophecy and history, we can see we're getting closer and closer to the return of this Jesus who rose. Are you with me? So what a wonderful thing. He said, if, if he didn't, we are to be pitied. But verse 20 says the truth for us. He answers his own question. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. He has indeed been raised. The early Christians used to greet each other with this. Christ is risen. And then one, the other one would say, He is risen indeed. Turn to your neighbor and one say, Christ is risen. And the other just say, He is risen indeed. Amen? We are saying yes and amen to the fact that Jesus has risen from the grave. We are agreeing with it. Yes, amen. We believe. Praise the Lord. That's why we're here to celebrate. He is risen indeed. As a matter of fact, it goes on. Praise God. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Now watch this. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Everybody say first fruits. 
That's an important word in understanding this. Praise God. You see, at the time that Jesus was put on the cross, all of the Jews from around the world were commanded by God in the commandments, in the law, in the law of Moses that they received on Sinai. He said, Moses, tell the people, remember when I brought you out of Egypt. Remember the Passover. Remember the day I told you to kill the spotless lamb inside the house and take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost outside the house. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. He said, on that day, from here on out, for generations, I want you to teach the people to celebrate this Passover. And so every year, they had to, by law of God, make a pilgrimage from wherever they lived around the world, get their families, put them on the donkeys, the mules, whatever they had, the camels. They had to travel, make a journey all the way to Jerusalem. And they had to celebrate the Passover, remembering what God had done for their forefathers coming out of Egypt. So every year for 1,500 years from that time, it was generation to generation passed down. They would come and they would bring their lambs. Each family, each father responsible for making sure that family had a spotless lamb to bring to sacrifice for the sins of their family. And every year, it got to be more and more distorted, more and more corrupt. It became a legal system um, operating under um, the law of Moses, but it was corrupted in such a way. By the time Jesus' life was there in the temple, in the middle of the temple uh, courts, they had a marketplace. And man, you might bring your spotless lamb that you've been working on all, all your, you know, this time, this year, to have one for your family. And that priest would look at it and say, he's no good. Let me have that one. I'll sell you another. That's why Jesus walked in that court and kicked, hey, in front of all that crowd with the temple guards watching, he made a whip and he kicked over their money tables and he drove them out. Hey, our Jesus, he's meek, but he's not weak. And man, the leaders of the temple said, why didn't you arrest him? And they said, oh, no one has ever spoke like this man. You know, they couldn't handle it. And you know, and then so while this is happening, the reason why I'm telling you this, he is the first fruits. You see, Passover is connected to three feasts together. It's the feast of Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. It's all celebrated in this week. He, Jesus, fulfilled all of these feasts. One, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they had to get rid of all the leaven, and they made their, back in Egypt, when they were coming out, they made their bread with haste because they're leaving in the morning. It didn't have time to rise. Moses said, hey, continue to do this every year. And what it began to symbolize, it was showing that, you know, there was, the yeast was a symbol of sin, and Jesus was sinless. So he fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Jews, for all those years, when this Passover week was coming, they would sweep out their house, they would get rid of all the yeast, any ingredients on their shelves that had yeast in it, they would have to clean their house completely and get ready for the Passover. Well, Jesus fulfilled the unleavened bread by being sinless. And then, on that day of the Passover, the Bible says he was with his disciples, and his disciples said, Jesus... Where are we going to celebrate the Passover? And he said, hey, go into town. There's going to be a guy carrying a jar of water. Follow him. We're going to eat at his house. And there was a room prepared. He and his disciples went. And were all the Jews, I'm telling you, hundreds of thousands from around the world come into Jerusalem. Jerusalem had the great temple that was rebuilt. And it's on the Temple Mount. And it's shining gloriously. Herod had added on to the temple for the Jews to try to keep peace in this Roman Empire section. There's Roman soldiers walking around. Come on now, think of it. I want to take you there for a minute. It would be like you walking outside here and there's Russian tanks and soldiers around and we're living under the Russians. 
That's what it was like in Jesus' day. The Jews were under a foreign empire, Rome, that had soldiers walking around. So during this time, you have the Jews and you have Herod and you have the, the temple, but you also have Pontius Pilate and you have the Caesars and you have those saying, hey, you Jewish leaders better keep control on these people or we will. Okay, so that's the, that's the day in which Jesus came. Now, all of the people have been crying out and believing. They're reading the scriptures and they're understanding that there's a Messiah coming. And they're looking for this Messiah to raise an army and overthrow Rome. That's the mentality of the kingdom of God coming. That's what they were thinking. So when Jesus comes and he's preaching, love your enemy, some of them are like, no way, man. This can't be our Messiah. Do good to those that hurt you, you know. My kingdom's about a higher kingdom than this. You know, they, some of them, so the people were divided. They're seeing folks healed of leprosy. They're seeing him preach love to the sinners and reach out to them and stand on the mighty steps of the temple and rebuke the most religious of the day. And man, a lot of those people are like, wow, this guy's bold. I've been wanting to say that to those religious fools all my life. And he's the only one. Others were under the bondage of the religion and, you know, were scared that he was saying this. So this is the time of the day that Jesus came. And here he says, I want to tell you about Passover, unleavened bread and first fruits. So thousands are around. Jesus takes his disciples into that upper room. He washes their feet. He begins to share with them. He begins to try to show them what this is really all about. And he ushers in the new covenant. And he lifts the cup and said, this is the blood of the new covenant. Amen? So he's fulfilling the old and ushering in the new. At the time of this Passover, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, is the very time that all these families are bringing their lambs to the priests at the temple and they're slaying the lambs for the sin of their families. At that same time, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world was hanging on the cross. Do you see the connection? Okay. So all of those years, 1,500 years, that they were celebrating the Passover, the Passover was really always all about Jesus, the one lamb. Now, here's some good news for you, sir. Do you know when they brought all those years for 1,500 years, when they brought the lamb to the priest, the priest would have to examine to see if it was spotless enough to be good enough to cover their sin. But the priest would not examine the man. The priest would examine the lamb. And if the lamb was good enough, your sins were washed. Amen? Jesus, the sinless, spotless lamb, went on the cross to pay for our sin one time and for all, forever, hallelujah, forever washing you, cleansing you, that you who believe are cleansed and right with God forever, not based on what we have done or God examining us, but God examining Christ. So when God sees me, hallelujah, he sees the blood of Jesus and he has passed over. I have passed from death to life. I have eternal life right now. I'm not waiting till I die. I have already died. I have already been buried. The Bible says we, were, we died with him. We we're buried with him. Our old nature that was a sinner is dead and buried and we have risen to life. In the eternal life I have right now, one day I'm going to shake off this full flesh. I'm going to get a new one and I'm going to keep on living. But praise God. Me and God are living together right now. Hallelujah. I tell y'all, when I come out of Walmart, I ask God, where did we park? <laughs> We walk together now. Amen? We're enjoying life. Folks, that's the point. So, watch this. So I showed you how he fulfilled unleavened bread and he fulfilled the Passover. But do you know, as part of this, the first fruits was also a feast connected with the other two. Okay? These three feasts together. And what they would do in the spring of the year, praise God at this time, that's why we're celebrating it, their first crop was barley. And they would go and the Jews would gather the first 
sheaves of barley that were ready. Just like we would used to gather the first bale of cotton around here and kind of celebrate it, they would gather the first sheaves of the barley harvest. And they would bring it to the temple because it's a principle that the first belongs to God. That's why, that's why I tithe. My first belongs to God. Amen? Everything, every harvest that you receive has meat to eat and seed to sow. Every apple has seed to sow and meat to eat. You don't want to eat the seed. You want to sow the seed and eat the meat. So when every time you get a paycheck, inside that paycheck is meat to eat and seed to sow. Don't eat your seed. You're blocking your next harvest. I just threw that out there. That wasn't in my notes. But anyway, because it has to do with first fruits. So they would bring the barley harvest, the first, to the temple. They would bring it to the priests. They would lay it on the altar and give it to God. How did you give things to God in that way? You sacrificed it. You killed it, okay? They would bring the first, the best and the first of the sheaves of the harvest to God because if they offered it to God and he accepted it, he would guarantee he would bless the rest. This is the principle of first fruits. This is the principle of your tithe. This is the principle of it all. Now watch this, but really, I'm telling you, that the Passover was all about Jesus? Really? First fruits, the tithe is all about Jesus. Watch this. So they would bring this barley harvest, they would sacrifice it, God would consume it on the altar with a fire, and they would know it was accepted, and now they can rejoice. Why? Because the rest of their crop is now blessed. Watch this. The Bible says Jesus is the first fruits of mankind. He was sacrificed on the altar for all of us. God accepted his sacrifice by raising him from the dead, guaranteeing a full harvest of the world. That's why you're here. You've come in to contact in the presence of God because God accepted the first fruit harvest of Jesus. Are you with me? So we're celebrating, praise God, the Passover when he died on the cross. But today we're celebrating first fruits when he rose from the dead. And if he rose from the dead, then God accepted him. God has guaranteed, I'm going to bring in a harvest from every nation on earth of the people, praise the Lord. So you're a part of that great harvest because Jesus' sacrifice was accepted. Amen? Are you with me? Praise the Lord. Now let's look. Let's look a little closer. Go with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. Hallelujah. Praise God, I've got some time. I've got lots to share with you today. Isn't God good? How many learned something already? Two of you? Who, how many learned something already? In the past? Well, praise God. Praise God, you know. We're to take this word and unfold it and talk about it and teach it because faith comes by hearing. As we hear the word, the word is alive and it grows in us. And the more we understand it, praise the Lord, the more we can see Jesus. So now that we, you know, maybe you've un never understood unleavened bread, Passover, and first fruits, now that you do, you can see Christ more clearly in Easter. You can see Christ more clearly in the giving the first fruits and guaranteeing the rest. You can understand the Bible better because really this whole big thing makes sense. You know, people have trouble saying, well, this is confusing, doesn't line up with... Oh, yeah, it does. It all lines up. If something doesn't line up in your mind, you just are ignorant of that thing. You need to grow a little further. You need to go a little deeper. You need somebody to teach you. You need some help. You need to learn because it all lines up and it's all a beautiful picture of Christ. The whole thing is about him. Amen? We're so glad to have teachers and books and videos and all kind of things. There's so much word going out today. We're building upon what Paul had taught. The Holy Spirit's continuing to teach and reveal and growing this so we can all understand him. Glory to God. Now, Matthew 27, we're going to look at the time that he was um, on the cross and what happened all here. Matthew 27, starting in verse 45. 
The Bible says from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over the land. Now, their time frame was different. We're talking about three o'clock in the afternoon here. In a loud voice, he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My Hebrew or Greek's not real good. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, if you read the four Gospels, you'll see everywhere Jesus talked about God. He always called him Father, Abba, Daddy. A close, intimate relationship. This is the first time you hear him cry out, my God, my God, why did he say it like this? Why have you forsaken me? It's the first time he ever felt separated from God. He was sinless. You see, God is holy and mankind was sinful. We had the sin nature passed down from Adam. There was a blockage, a barrier. But yet God so loved the sinful man, he had always had a plan to fix it. Amen? Jesus came not born from Adam, but born of God, so he didn't have the sinful nature of Adam. Okay? He was the second Adam. The first Adam fell in the garden. The last Adam won in the wilderness. The same Satan that tempted Adam in the garden tempted Jesus in the wilderness. The first Adam fell to it. The last Adam won. Amen? See, it had to be a man to win it back because God gave dominion over the earth to man. Come on, get that. I'm telling you something, something deep right here. The whole, if there's problem in the world, if there's problem in government, if you ask him sometimes, if God's so good, why is there a messed up world? Because he gave dominion to rule the earth to man. And then when man fell, now we have a problem. Fallen man's in charge. So a man had to win it back. Hallelujah. So God sent his word, the word of God who created everything, who is God. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He became one of us, even though he was also the son of God. But as one of us who felt all temptation we did, he didn't fall. So he became man's hero. The first Adam fell, everybody with him. The last Adam won, and we who believe become like him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. In God's sight, all mankind's a sinner until we believe in Christ, are born again, and now we have his righteousness. So on the cross, he's hanging, and he fulfills the law by becoming our sin. Our sin is imputed into him, and he who knew no sin, he became sin for us. And as he becomes sin, he feels separated from God, and he says, why have you forsaken me? He's never felt it before. Why? Because your sin, my sin, was now in him. You know? And now the wrath of God, the penalty of the law, the righteous judgment that is just and holy and right, that says sin must be dealt with with death, that penalty falls on him <laughs> instead of us. Isn't that wonderful? It falls on Jesus instead of us. And when it does... God accepts the payment. He accepts the payment that Jesus did for all of our sin. He accepts it, praise the Lord. And because he accepts it, hallelujah, Jesus rises from the grave. Praise God, Easter Sunday morning. We're here celebrating the resurrection. He rises from the grave. Now we who believe in him, we're born again of him. So, folks, I show this to pastors. It's like having a line of a race of people from Adam here. Everyone after Adam has the sin nature. Every nation, every people on earth. And then Jesus comes not from Adam. And we who believe in him were born again, not of a human decision, not of a mother and father getting together physically. No, we who believe in him were born again from above like he is. And it's as though we start a new race of people. Come on, do you have that picture in your mind? So there's two kinds of people on earth. Not Chinese, Japanese, black, white, this, that, and the other. No, there's those that are born of Adam and those that have been born again, a new creation, new. We are from above. We're not from below. We have kingdom life. We have abundant life. We have the righteousness of Christ in us, and that's who we are. That's who we are. Isn't that amazing? It's like... You're a new species of people. 
That's why we get excited and celebrate the resurrection. That's why you see some folks dancing and singing and clapping and stuff. Man, we kind of know who we are now. Man, we, I don't deserve it. I can't, I can't do it on my own. It's not comes by my works. Man, I'm right with God completely 100. Man, I stand before you 100% right with God. Dude, I don't think I'm going to heaven. Heaven lives in me. It's already there. But see, I'm not standing boasting in anything I've done. I'm boasting in what he has done for me. You see, he purchased my ticket and gave it to me as a gift. I don't deserve it, but I received it by faith. Isn't it amazing? That's why we call it amazing grace. Amazing. Now, folks, I understand. I have this treasure, and so do you inside an earthen vessel in this earthen vessel you are a spirit you have a soul and you live in a body and your soulless realm is your personality your mind your will your emotions where you make decisions okay and your flesh your flesh is still sometimes prone to what happened in the fall although good news is what's in our spirit can give life to our mortal body even now and many times in here, it already has. Amen? Amen? But anyway, so you sometimes struggle between your ears. You had 40 years of living wrong. And as soon as you're born again, all those memories doesn't change right away. That's why it's good to come and be a part of a local church and a class and get involved and read and renew your mind to the truth of what's in your spirit because when you renew your mind to the truth of what's in your spirit, you'll have the power to start walking it out. Amen. You see, so many families and people are praying, Lord, save my daughter. Do something to help my child. Do this, do that. And God's saying, it is finished. I did it 2,000 years ago. Jesus cried out, you know, to tell us die. It is finished. Everything that needs to happen to save the world has been done. What we need to do is hear the good news, believe the good news, and start walking in it. So if there's areas you're not walking in victory... You don't have to ask Jesus to do something to fix it. He's already done it. What you need to do is grow in the knowledge of the truth and start applying it to your life. And as you do, you'll walk in the victory. Everybody say, it's a finished work. Six days, he created the world. On the seventh day, he rested. He put it into the law. All the old time Jews, you had to not work on the Sabbath. It's a picture of his rest. Jesus finished the work of all of the law on the cross, and we who believe in him, we enter into his Sabbath day's rest. The Sabbath is not a day. The Sabbath is a person. Dude, I'm hanging out in his rest. I walk in his rest, okay? I don't have to have anxiety and struggle in mind about this, that, or other. We're winning. We're in his rest now. And from his position of victory and rest, we live our life. It's so much better than having to try to fight for it. You know? I, I defeat the enemy. I don't have to holler and yell, praying against the devil. Here's how I defeat the devil. I rest in Christ. And when the devil attacks, say, hey, it is finished. Christ has won my victory, not only for me, but for my family, for my job, for my children, for my children's children. And praise the Lord, by faith, we can all walk in it. But you can't walk in what you don't know. You can't walk in what you don't know. Everything you need for life and godliness has been given and as you grow in knowledge of the truth, you can apply it to your life. Oh, my son David John was calling me last night, was telling me, Dad, here's what I'm preaching tomorrow. He's preaching about that word potential. You know? The victory for all you believers is already there. It's potential, but you have to access it by faith. Just like salvation. Watch this, church. The sin for the world, the, the payment for sin for the world has already been done. 
all those out there who are still struggling in their sin, the payment for them is done. It's finished. God doesn't have to pay for their sins. It's already done. What they have to do is come to the knowledge of it, hear it, believe it, and then access it by faith. The same thing with your healing. The same thing with your marriage trouble. The same thing with your financial trouble. The same thing with your head. Any kind of problems you have, the victory has been won. And as we grow in the Word, we grow in the truth, and we can access what He has available to you. That's why coming to church once a year for Easter is not enough, folks. you got to grow in this truth. I want you to come back Sunday. If you're a visitor here too, let me get to know you. I'll take you to lunch. We'll tell you about this. Okay? God wants to bless your family. Everything. Well, you just don't know about my marriage. Hey, I know about my Lord. Well, you don't know about the trouble I have. Yeah, I know about my Lord. I don't want to talk about your problems. I want to talk about your answers. Jesus is the answer to it all. Amen? Wow. I'm not through yet. What do I do with my glasses? Here they are. Praise the Lord. Let me move on. I got something else to share with you. Glory to God. Wow, so here he is. He cries out, why have you forsaken me? The Bible goes on to say, look at verse 50. I love to share this. I share this every Easter for the last 15 years. And when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, and if you look at the Gospel of John, you know what he cried. To tell us that it is finished. That's what he cried out in a loud voice. He gave up the spirit. Verse 51. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Okay? We've shared with this church many a times. Maybe you're a guest and haven't heard. That veil of the temple. We're talking about that big temple um, on, on the mountain. You know, that's knocked down now. There's only the western wall left of the Temple Mount. With that temple in Jesus' day that Herod had helped them rebuild, you know, to try to make friends with the Jews so he can have control with the Romans there. There it was. They had that outer court, an inner court, a holy place, and the most holy place called the Holy of Holies. The most holy place was blocked off by a large curtain. No one could go in there except for the high priest once a year in the fall on the Day of Atonement to apply the blood. At Passover, the fathers were given the blood of the lamb for the sins of their family. At Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the high priest was given the blood for the sins of all of Israel as a nation. So he would only go in once a year. But now, when Jesus was on the cross, and the sin of Israel, the sin of you, the Gentiles, the sin of the whole world, was completely punished in Christ, And completely washed, now the earth shook, there was an earthquake, and the veil was rent from top, meaning God did it, to the bottom, meaning man didn't do it. And now it's open, inviting all of us in. So the Bible says we can now enter into the presence of God through the veil of his flesh. And now you know what that means. So we enter by receiving Christ By receiving Christ, I have entered into a relationship with the one who created it all. And me and him are buds. Me and God. He no longer calls me servant. He said, I call you friend. Because a friend knows his master's will. As a matter of fact, because I've entered into a relationship with God, he said, in Christ, I want you to be a co-laborer with Christ and take this good news around the world. Wow, think about that. He's inviting us to be a co labor with him in his grand scheme of things to take this good news around the earth, and then he's coming back. Folks, whatever you're doing, teaching, working in the medical field, whatever you're doing, it's good. We're not all called to be a pastor of a church, but in everything we do, do it as unto the Lord. 
Serve the people. If you're serving gas, serve them as though you're serving Jesus. Serve the people. Share your testimony. Uh, be involved in a local church that's doing something around the world. Be involved, whatever you're doing, be involved in the Great Commission. Why? Because when he comes back, he's not judging us for our sin, but our works will be judged and will be rewarded according to what we have done. Folks, I've got to tell folks that right now and get you ready because you, I don't want you to blame me that I didn't tell you. Look, you make it to heaven on what Christ has done, but the Bible says clearly you will be rewarded for what you have done with it. So the time to get things done for the Lord is now while you're living. Don't just be about me, my four, no more. You be a part of the kingdom work of God. I'm telling you now because some of you are going to take action on this and then thank me later. Wow, Pastor Dave, I'm glad you told me this. I started getting involved in what the kingdom's doing, and now look at the rewards I have. I got to enjoy that because there's different rewards for different people. There's different punishments for different people in hell. A lot of folks don't know that. It's clear. It's in there. It's in there. Amen? And if you keep on coming, I'll teach you more on it. All right? Praise the Lord. So, now watch this. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, verse 51. The earth shook and the rock split. Now, verse 52, I never heard preach all my life until I started seeing it for myself and started sharing it. I don't know why it's not preached. I think it's great. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Stop and think. Some of y'all never seen that before. Look at it. I'm not making it up. It's right there. When Jesus rose, the Bible says also, the tombs of many opened and many people rose. There was a mass resurrection. Did you know that? It's amazing. It's been right here all along. The tombs broke open and the dead were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they let him rise first. Then they went back into the city. And what did they do? They appeared to many. Wow. I like to say it might have looked like this. If you were dead in the family and buried, and then you rose from the grave, where would you go? I know what I'd do. Hey, honey, it's me. I'm back. Wouldn't you go back to your family? What do you think they did? The Bible says... That praise God. It says, the tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Do you believe in the resurrection? You're going to believe you're going to rise? Well, some of them already did. Okay, can you believe that too? It's, it's the word, it's true. You know what? I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. Why? This is right here. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, where did they go? They went to the city and appeared to many. Who would you appear to first? You'd go home to your family and show. Imagine what's going on in Jerusalem. I told you that people had come thousands from all around the world. They had to come to Jerusalem for the Passover. Now as they're getting there, they're hearing about this Jesus. They're hearing talk about him. Could he be the Messiah? Could he be the one? And the people are divided because of him. Just like today, this country is divided. Many of the world is divided. Do you know that this morning on the news, praise God, one of my guys came tell me there was three bombs in three Sri Lanka uh, churches where the Buddhists came in and attacked Christians and killed many. The world is not only we have peace with God because of him, but the world is divided because of him. Got to learn to deal with that too. And that's not going to get better. Christianity is going to grow and flourish, but the world's going to go the other way and the division's going to become starker more clear i'm getting you ready for that okay start raising your kids in church dear god do i need to say this dear god do i need to say this there's a division my grandbaby was just born as i had that little baby i had prayed i've prayed already for all my grandkids lay hands on the wombs and believe for them. Do 
you know what I ask God? Now, don't stone me for this. Just listen. Lord God, I want my children to have children's children. And you continue if they're going to know you. But if they're not going to know you, don't let them be born. Because if they're not going to know them, they're going to end up in hell. Parents, you have a responsibility to raise your children to know Christ. They're going to learn more from what you do than what you say. Yeah, y'all go to church. I'm not going. It's not that important to me, but I want y'all, y'all go ahead. They're going to learn more from your attitude of what they see than what you say. Do you want your kids in heaven or hell? Do you want them in Christ? You have a responsibility to raise your children in the nurture and admission of the Lord. You know, the word says it'd be better for you not to have been born than to be born and end up without him. Whatever you're doing that might be leading your kids astray, stop it today. Stop it today, I beg you. Stop it today and start leading them to know him. If you don't know enough truth, come get some more, man. We've got, there's teachers all over the world that, man, been when teaching this for 2,000 years. The knowledge of it's growing. It's getting stronger. The reality is getting more real. The, you know what we're understanding about him. The Holy Spirit is opening us up to all the truth. You can know all the truth, but you have to want to seek it. And you don't get this truth by just scrolling through Facebook or watching a bunch of new series shows that come out. The world is full of distractions. The world is full of distractions. I'm glad you're here. You're not of those looking for distractions. You're of those who want to come celebrate the resurrection of the Savior. Wow. I got five minutes. I got something else to say. I got years of study I want to share with you. Okay? I don't know a lot of things. You know, I have to call somebody from Fresh Start to come change my oil. While I was in Africa, my wife would call them the belt broke on the lawnmower. Okay? I don't know a lot of things. Those aren't my gifts, but this is my gift. Let me share my gift with you, and you can share your gift with me, and we'll grow together. Amen? We all have different gifts for a reason. And it's good. Whatever gift you have, do it. We need folks in the oil field. We need folks in education. We need all of these things working together. But as Christians, do whatever you do as unto the Lord. Amen? And together we'll advance the kingdom. One more thing. Then I'm going to try to close. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Let's go to Luke 24. I love this story too. I can do a week on it, but I'm just going to do five minutes, four minutes. Luke 24. Now that same day, the day Jesus rose, Luke 24, verse 13, that same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked, they discussed these things with each other. Jesus himself came up and walked among them, but they were kept from recognizing him. What were they doing? They're walking seven miles. Together, they're talking about everything. They're talking about the Passover. They're talking about the high priests and all those trying to crucify, crucify Jesus. They talk about Pilate. They talk about a lot of the people who believe in him. They talk about a lot of the people who don't. They're talking about, could he be the Messiah? What is this? You know, it, it didn't happen the way we thought it would come. They're talking. And as these two men are walking, Jesus, the living God who created heaven and earth, decides to walk with them. And he walks with them in a disguise like they don't know who he is. He just keeps them from record. And as they're walking and talking, he's saying, what y'all talking about? And then he says, oh, foolish of heart and unwise, why didn't you believe the scriptures? Don't you know that you could have known all of this was going to happen to him if you would have read? I know a lot of things that's going to happen in the next few years. I've read it. He said, you could have known about this Jesus and the Messiah and what's going to happen. It was written in Isaiah. It was written in Jeremiah. It was written in Daniel. But because you didn't, here, let me go ahead and explain. And then watch this. So I close with this. Watch what he tells them. Praise the Lord. In verse 27, 
And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. What's he saying? This whole thing's about Jesus. We read Moses and the law and the feasts and the ark and everything in there is now we can relate it and show you Jesus in it. The Holy Spirit now lives in us and can open the scriptures to us, all of us, and show us Jesus through the whole thing. The whole book is about him. So he started explaining to them, hey, you guys know this scripture. They all knew. They knew the scriptures. They were Jews. They grew up in synagogue. They read the scrolls every day. They had to memorize a lot of the Torah. And he would take that and said, here, you remember it said this? This is what it means. You remember it said that? This is what it means. You know the Passover? Hey, Jesus is the Passover lamb. You know the Ark of the Covenant? He is the Ark. You know the rock that followed him in the wilderness that flowed out water? He is that rock that followed them. You know the manna that rained down from heaven? He is the manna. Praise the Lord. He began to show them everything in the book is about him, but yet half the church don't know the book. Because they come on Easter Sunday. There's folks. Last thing. If this is real to you, you know, I know we got guys and ladies in our program that, I don't know, for 20, 30 years been away from church. You missed some, a few Sunday school lessons. We're going to help catch you up. That's why we have classes three times a day. We're trying to catch you up from things you missed. All right? You okay to that? Yeah. Y'all all right? Am I offending you? Nope. I'm just being real, right? Yeah. Okay. We want to catch you up. Because everything in it is all about Christ. And the more you see him, the more you will receive his love. He loves you. He wants to show himself to you. And as he shows himself to you through his word, you will fall in love with him. And as you fall in love with him and receive his love for you, praise God, you'll want to follow him. Church, if you believe that Jesus rose from the dead... Final question, if you believe that Jesus rose from the dead, that he's the son of God, the most obvious next logical thing is I want to know more, isn't it? If this is real, then by golly, I want my kids to know it and my grandkids to know it. If Jesus rose from the dead and he's the only way to have eternal life and he's coming back again, man, Lord, what do I need to do to teach my grandchildren? What do I need to do to teach my kids? What do I need to do to learn how to love my wife? What do I need to do to bless my family? Lord, if this is real, I want to know not a little about you. I want to know everything about you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, we have many in this place that have been with us a long time, many that have heard this truth. And it got in them, and they started seeking more for themselves. That's why we have dozens of teachers and preachers and leaders in this place. Come be a part. Get together with us as he sends us out all over the world to be a part of his great commission. Hallelujah. I want to do something just a little different. I'm going to pray for you. With my eyes open, looking at you. If you can stand it, just look back at me. Okay? It's all right. There's lots of ways you can stand. Praise the Lord. Father, as I look around this congregation all over, Lord, these people came here today because they believe in you. And they wanted to honor what you have done in dying for our sins and rising from the grave. Lord God, as we, this small congregation in this country town, join faith with millions around the world who are celebrating your resurrection now, Lord, would you receive our praise along with theirs as a great praise to you? We welcome you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord. Now, Father, because we believe it, we want to know more. Bring me back. Let me be involved in advancing your kingdom around the world before you come back. Show me what to do. Help me, Lord, to be involved with a local church 
here or somewhere that's doing kingdom work to be involved in your great commission. Lord, bless every home, every family. The resurrected life that's in you now dwells in every believer. May that resurrected life strengthen them, strengthen their minds, strengthen their bodies, strengthen their families, their marriages. In Jesus' name, we speak your blessing on the people. Amen.